Hey TC family, love it that you are locked into this commentary video as we look at the message from Sunday or today, uh, if you're watching on Sunday, if you're watching on Tuesday, then it's Sunday, uh, that we look at the message and we just kind of highlight some different points and unpack it together. Because I, I think I say this every single week, but this is really what I want you to understand, is that if you just listen to a sermon, if you just listen to a podcast, but you don't take time to unpack it and apply it to your life, you're wasting your time. We don't want to be people to waste time. We want to be people that actively embrace challenge, people with humble hearts that are ready to learn and grow. That's what TC is all about. And if you are tuning in, you are part of TC. So we love you and we can't wait to get into it. Let's go. Get swept under the current, be brought away by the current and take part in declaring this message of uncertainty, negativity, and, and chaos, right? So today I actually wanna spend some time talking about how you and I, how all of us have been called and equipped to be agents of peace, just like how Jesus was called to be God's agent of peace in this world. And this is part three of our series. What a challenging intro. Uh, right off the bat, I love it how Spencer speaks to our higher calling um, to be agents of peace rather than agents of negativity and chaos. Um, this is what I've learned. <clears throat> In fact, actually, could I reference Jesus for a second? But Jesus says that if the eye is bad, that the whole body is bad. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying <clears throat> that how we see ourselves, how we see, it's going to taint everything. And if we see everything through negativity, tragedy, and chaos, then it doesn't matter what God could be doing. It won't matter what God has done. It doesn't matter how God is working in and through people around us. Everything we'll see will be tainted with that negative negativity. And it's so destructive to our life. And it's like one of those things where because Spencer communicates in such a gentle way, if you don't really pay attention, you could miss how challenging that is. But I would say the pushback that you should feel is, am I someone who always sees what is wrong first? I had a good friend, he would always joke around, he would say, I'm a glass of the water is half empty kind of guy, I'm not an optimist. And I'm like, uh, focusing on what is wrong doesn't mean you're not an optimist, it just means you're a negative person. If you just walk around in life, poking the holes in things and trying to be like, no, this is wrong, they should do this, this is this, then you're just a negative person. And I would say you gotta take a step back and bring some balance to that so you can be aware of what God has done and what God is doing. Try to surrender the chaos that you're going through in your mind, surrender the lack of peace or the negativity that you're feeling and embrace that God is always working. Embrace the truth of who God is. You know, usually in my experience, if you're someone that sees that negativity or someone who kind of has that storm, that chaos going on inside of them, there is some trauma that needs to be healed. I'm just gonna speak really to the heart of it. Usually that means that there is some hurt, some offense, some insecurity. Maybe you felt rejected. Maybe you felt offended by a person or a job or a boss or a church. Maybe a church has offended you. So now at church, all you see are the things that are wrong. But you may not even be aware of the offense and this negative perspective, this negative way of seeing things. It's actually the symptom that God wants to use to show you, man, why do I always see the negative first? Why don't I see the positive? Why don't I see the beauty? Why don't I see God's work and allow that to bring a heart of peace? It's really, really good, really challenging point from Spencer. And we don't say, ha, you're down on the ground. Yeah, this is my time to gain more, to take more. This is my time to win. No, church, our call is not to do that, not to fight flesh and blood, but to declare the gospel over these other people. And what's the gospel? It's the good news of Christ. It's us declaring, hey, Jesus loves you. Hey, Jesus is with you. Hey, Jesus has come to save you, and he wants to have a personal relationship with you that you are the apple of God's eye. That's what we're called to declare and preach to other people. But, but, church, listen close. We gotta start with ourselves. We've got to start with ourselves. You know, I read a study 
uh, two different studies, actually. The first one is the fact that the human brain produces about 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, 80% of which are negative. Crazy, right? Mind-blowing, but that's our brain. And another study says we spend 60% of our conversations with other people talking about, talking about ourselves. And that's when we're with other people. So imagine what happens to our brain when we think by ourselves. Imagine how much more we think about ourselves. And chances are, because so many of our thoughts are negative, we think negatively of ourselves. We say negative things about us. And I struggle with this too. Like I said earlier, I'm married now. I got married five months ago. And the biggest lie that I struggle with right now is the fact that I'm not and I can never be a good husband. And it's so crazy because these thoughts come right after I do something for and with my wife. So a good example is I would take my wife to work and then I would come home and when I'm alone, for some reason, my mind automatically produces these thoughts. Spencer, you're not a good husband. You'll never be a good husband. You can't lead your wife. You're, you're not going to be able to lead a family. You don't even have it all together. How are you expecting to lead other people and raise kids to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ? And yeah, like the truth is, maybe sometimes I can do better as a husband. Oh my gosh. So there's, that was like a longer one, but I just feel like that's so important what he's talking about. And maybe you've heard this before, but the battle isn't out here. The battle is in here. And I think Pastor Janae is going to touch on this a bit when she talks about the helmet of salvation, because the war of salvation is in between your ears. That's why it's the helmet, right? It's that faith battle of really believing here who God says you are. Um, and the truth is, is those stats are real. 80% of our thoughts are negative. We're thinking about ourselves in a negative way. Oftentimes we're being cynical. And then oftentimes we're projecting that on others. This is how other people see me. They see me like this. They see me this way. They see me this way. And that is absolutely getting in the way of us being these agents of peace. If we can't handle having peace here, if it's chaos in here, if it's disturbance in here, how are we going to usher in peace out here? The work starts at home, people. If you have a culture of chaos, frustration, conflict in your family relationships and in your office, it's because that is what's going on out he in here and it's just bleeding over into the rest of your life. And I love it when he said, the thing that, that brings peace is the gospel. And then he actually articulated what he means by that. And he talked about how the gospel is good news. Hello, good news. So if you hear a message that isn't good news related to Jesus, it ain't the gospel, sweetheart. So the gospel is good news. And what's that good news? That Jesus is for you, that he loves you, that he wants a relationship with you, that you are the apple of God's eye. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. He loved the world, so he gave his only son for you. It starts with he loved the world. That is the good news of the message of Jesus. And when we start to silence the critical voices inside of our heads, I'm not a good husband, I'm not a good wife, I'm not worthy, there's no second chances, this, that, blah, blah, blah. When we start to silence that with how much does God love me? How affirmed am I in him? I'm already complete. My joy is complete in the love and affection of the creator of the universe. When we meditate on those things, dwell on those things, focus on those things, watch how the storm inside of us subsides. There's a pretty famous story in the Gospels where Jesus and the disciples are in a boat and they're going through choppy waters and it's a really intense storm and it said that Jesus silenced the storm. The question would be, are you going to allow Jesus to silence the storm in your heart? Are you going to allow Jesus to silence the chaos in your mind? You know, I've been on a boat before and I remember the difference between being on a boat that uh, was traveling through choppy waters and being on a boat that was anchored in choppy waters. When I was on a boat that was traveling through choppy waters, it was terrifying. You're hitting the waves and it almost feels like the boat is going to flip over and capsize. But being in a boat where it's anchored, the boat still shifts and the boat still bumps and, and goes up and down. 
but there's something secure there. There's something steady keeping that boat in a safe position. And I really believe that that's the analogy that when we are anchored in Jesus, in his good news about our life, that there may be hardship. There may be storms inside of us, but the storms aren't bringing chaos and the storms are not taking our peace because we're anchored in something bigger. We're anchored in something greater. We're not anchored in our own power. I want you to hear me. We're not make anchored in our own power and our own reason. I think there's somebody watching right now, I just feel it, man, that you're going through really deep personal conflict in your family. And you think that it's on your shoulders to resolve it, to fix it, and to reason it out, to try to analyze it and decide who's right and who's wrong. But I would say that that's robbing your peace. And the reason why it's robbing your peace is because you're anchored in yourself. You're anchored in your own abilities. But what this is inviting you to do is to anchor into Jesus and surrender to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help in this storm. I need your peace. I need your peace first here. So then your peace will bleed out and over in my life in all these different areas. See, it's amazing when we let Jesus do the work here, how everything else changes. So good. But the point is, in my life and probably in yours, our shoes signify that we're ready to go, that we're ready to go out the door. So as we talk about the shoes of peace today, I wanna to ask you this question. What are we ready for? Where are we ready to step out to? I love that so much. Let's just, let's just take a look at this right now. And if this doesn't challenge you, I don't know what will. Are you living your life in idle condition? Are you just reactionary, kind of going through the motions, going to the office because you got to go to the office, returning this message, writing this email, or are you living with intention? Because what Spencer is trying to say, and he did it in such a great, gentle way, that the reason why we have shoes of peace is because we are expectant that God is going to take us somewhere where peace is needed. We're going to go somewhere where we are needed as the, an agent of peace. Just like you put on your shoes when you're ready to go, we put on peace because we expect that God is going to take us somewhere where his peace will be needed. I love that so much. What if we looked at going into the office every day and looking at situations and looking at people that were stressed, tired, going through things, and we said, God has brought me here to bring his peace to these people. What if every time we reply to a message on WhatsApp or an email, we think through our heads, man, how can I be a peacemaker? How can I take an anxious email or a frustrated uh, teammate or partner and reply in a way that's going to bring a tone of peace to this conversation? Do we have that kind of expectancy that when we put on shoes, we're going somewhere, and when we put on peace, we're going somewhere that needs peace? I don't think so. So good, so good. Listen to this. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, so don't let your hearts be troubled and don't let them be afraid. Jesus is saying the more we declare the gospel, the more we remember the truths of God, and the more we remind other people of the truth of God, we step into God's peace. And this peace, in Greek, it actually means when everything is in its proper place. In other words, when we have God's peace, we know that everything is in his control still, that he's putting things in their place just for us because he loves us so much and he wants us to live a great full life with him. This peace means knowing when we're in the storm that Jesus is in control of that storm, that he's conquering and walking over that storm. And in fact, he's inviting us out into the water to conquer the storm and walk on the storm with him, just like Jesus did with Peter. So this is how we walk and engage with God's peace. So TC, what does it mean for us to put on the shoes? which is the readiness given by the gospel of peace, it simply means that we're always ready to declare God's truth, to dismantle the lies of the devil by saying out God's truth over ourselves and over other people. It's saying the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's saying that God loves me and God has equipped me 
to extend his love to other people. And that's the key. We do this with other people. We do this with community. We don't ever have to do this alone, church. And that's our heart at TC. Love it. What a great way to wrap up the message. Um, you know what it makes me think about? It makes me think about my 10-year-old son who oftentimes will come to the office with me and he'll, because he feels so home here, I assume, he'll take his shoes off and run around the office without any shoes on. And the way I teach him and the way I help him understand that that's inappropriate is I grab him and I say, hey bro, do you see everybody else running around the office? And do you see them taking off their shoes? And he's like, no, I don't know, dad. Why, why are you telling me this? And I say, well, y- you can kind of tell in the community or in everyone around you that they have their shoes on for something. So it must, there must be some intentionality there. There must be a reason they have their shoes on. So why don't you go put your shoes on too? Cause that's, it's a better idea to walk around with your shoes on. And it's funny because in this message, when we forget about our shoes of peace, when we don't fasten on that peace of Christ in our life, it's only when we're in community that we notice that we're the ones in the storm. I'll be hanging out with Vani, who's behind the camera, or my wife, or Jordan, and I'm so wound up about something, and they're so chill, and I'll be like, blah, 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 and then they look at me, and they're like, whoa, what's going on, bro? And it's all of a sudden you realize, you're like, I'm letting these storms of my life take me captive. I'm letting this chaos that's in my heart, in my head, take me captive. What I need to do is I need to bring resolution to these storms in Jesus. I need to be able to take on Christ and say, Jesus, I know what you say about me. I know you're for me. I know you're working in this situation. I know that I don't have everything figured out. I don't see everything, but you do. And I can put my trust in you. And as soon as I do that, as soon as I re-put on that peace, those shoes of peace, if you will, it's amazing because whatever storm was there before, it subsides. And I just think, you know what? Jesus is working. So why am I stressing? I'm going to let him take control here. I'm going to submit to him. I'm going to surrender to him. Sometimes the hardest thing to surrender, I'm going to shoot you real straight, guys. Listen to this. Sometimes the hardest thing to surrender is your perspective of how you think the world should work. How you think people should behave. How you think a church should work. How your office or your employees should work. But sometimes it's that perspective that is getting right stuck in the middle of the work that Jesus wants to do. So this is my invitation to you if you're watching this. The thing that may be getting in the way of your peace is your own perspective, the way you see things. And right now is the chance to be able to just say a prayer right where you are and say, Jesus, maybe it's my perspective and my unhealthy expectations based from insecurity or past offense. Maybe that's what's getting in the way of me really trusting you and receiving your peace trusting you and receiving your peace in my life so I can then be an agent of peace in other people's lives. I'm going to pray for all of us that we would just be able to take on that Christ-like perspective, that we would surrender and trust in him as the peace of our lives. So Father God, I just thank you so much. I thank you for this message from Spencer uh, and the gentle and beautiful way he communicated such a powerful truth that we absolutely are called to be agents of peace. But to be agents of peace, we have to clear up and have peace in our hearts first. So Father, I pray for everybody watching right now that if they feel stormed and conflicted, if they feel out of sorts internally, Lord, that they would be able to acknowledge that and then also surrender that to you. Know that they can put their trust in you and put their hope in you above their own reason, above their own frustrations, above their own perspectives, and they can just surrender their struggles to you, their frustrations to you, knowing that you're working and you are in control. So we pray these things. We put our trust in you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for jumping on to the message commentary video this week. Next week, we will be back. Can't wait to see you then.